Let us pray. God, I only do this with you. I would ask that you be with me as I seek to express your word and be with those who are listening as they seek to understand. Amen. One of our uh, little family traditions, for those of you who've known me to be here before, I've talked about my family. We have five children between Glenn and I, but one of our family traditions has been uh, family movie night. I started it with my boys when they were little and Glenn and I have carried it on. Now, since they are all uh, really grown up and in high school, uh, it doesn't happen as much anymore because they have social and sport activities, but we do try to fit it in from time to time. And I remember especially my youngest, Isaac, who would watch the movies and he would start to get really worried if the main character was in a tight spot. And when I could tell that he was really, really anxious and worried and, and not enjoying the movie, I would lean over and I would whisper, don't worry, it's the main character. I'm sure they'll make it through. <laughs> and eventually I could just whisper, main character and he would be able to relax and enjoy the show. The tables uh, turned on me a while ago when we were watching a movie together. It was a particularly suspenseful movie, and Isaac must have sensed that I was tensing up because he reached across the couch, and he, he patted me on the shoulder, and he whispered, main characters. <laughs> so as I journeyed through Lent this year, hearing again the story of Jesus' glorious entrance to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, and later the story of the Last Supper, his trial and crucifixion, I realized that as Christians, we can't move through the story of our faith to see what Jesus goes through, and on that night of the Good Supper, we can't whisper to each other main characters. Because our main character somehow doesn't get rescued at the last minute and no one shouts, you've got the wrong guy, as he's being nailed to the cross. We have to go through that sadness of Good Friday as his limp body is taken down and placed in the tomb. And after his death, his band of disciples and followers are left leaderless and without a clear direction, confused because they have finally realized exactly who and what Jesus is only to have him taken from their midst at the very height of his ministry. I'm sure they were wondering what was going to happen to them and to their movement after his death. If the Romans had killed Jesus, perhaps they would come after the rest of them as well. Now, luckily, while as Christians we don't have the reassurance of main characters making it to the end, we do get to experience surprise endings. Surprise endings are frequently a part of the parables that Jesus taught, and the resurrection is the biggest surprise ending of them all, as Jesus is risen on Easter Sunday. Death was no match for his divinity. When the women who traveled with him went to the tomb, they found it empty, not the result of grave, grave robbers, but the result of his resurrection. Definitely a remarkable event. And it was the topic of much discussion amongst the disciples, and as we hear from today's scripture reading, those who had not been in the inner circle, but had been there just to witness the events. So that's where we meet Cleopas and his companion as they are traveling on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus. And naturally enough, they are chatting about all that has gone on in Jerusalem. The triumphant entrance of Jesus, his trial, his crucifixion. They don't seem to know about the resurrection, but they do know that the women found the tomb empty. And as they're walking and talking, they're met by a third man who's curious about what they're discussing. We know he's Jesus, but these two don't recognize him. They explain that they're talking about Jesus, but they're so surprised that this man knows nothing about the recent events. So they explain about their hopes that this man who had been crucified would be the one who was going to redeem Israel. I can almost see them shrug their shoulders like, well, there's no longer any hope of that as Jesus is clearly now dead, even though his body can't be found. 
And Jesus tells them that they need only to look at scripture and at the stories of the prophets to know that this man is indeed the one who will redeem Israel. And he, he takes the time to explain all of this to them. And all the while, they still don't recognize him. As they get to Emmaus, Jesus appears to be continuing on his journey and they stop him, asking him to share their evening meal. He does. And in that symbolic act that we know so well as he breaks the bread. It is in that moment they recognize who he is. And then he's gone. Another surprise ending from our main character. I know I say this a lot. Glenn, my husband, can attest to that. But this really is one of my favorite pieces of scripture. Um, I like it for a number of reasons. I think that it has a lot to say for us today. Because after all, these two men are doing something that we do every week. As we journey through our lives, we take this time every week to talk about Jesus' life. And it makes me think that he is sitting out in the pews somewhere, traveling with us just as he walked along unrecognized by Cleopas and his friend. And just like those two men, we likely don't even realize it. And as I asked the, the children this morning, would the topics we discuss here or our manner of speaking about Jesus change if he thought that he were here sharing a pew with us? And I've been thinking a lot about that this week. Would how or what I preach change if I knew for certain that Jesus was sitting in the pews. I may not speak with as much confidence <laughs> about his intentions and his thoughts because I can only guess and discern what I can see in scripture. The advantage would be I could ask him, so what did you really mean by that parable? And so what I think is important for us today with this particular story is that this story is specifically showing us that after the resurrection, Jesus is still with us. And very importantly, he's still with us whether we recognize that he is with us or not. And it tells us that he may show up completely unexpectedly, but completely recognizably in our lives, as he became completely recognizable to Cleopas and his friend. And that, indeed, is good news. And I find it amazing that in this little piece of scripture, these few verses, this small story about a daily event, so commonplace, walking with a friend, in this little piece, we get the entire gospel. We find out that Jesus came to live among us, that he was cruelly killed, and that despite death, he is with us now. Now, if we weren't all stayed United Church members sitting quietly listening, that might rate someone shouting hallelujah from the congregation. But because we are stayed United Church mem members and we're a little more reserved in our worship, it's okay. I, I'm very confident you're shouting hallelujah in your hearts at that news. No, no one's going to go for it, are they? No. Okay. How many of you, well, we'll do some audience participation with this one then. How many of you have recently been walking with someone else and been chatting, I'll even say sitting across the table, uh, and chatting about Jesus' life and death? Hands up, anybody who's recently been doing that. Okay, has anybody recently been chatting with someone about the weather? <laughs> okay, I heard a lot of it this morning in the hallways. Okay, so a few people raised their hand. Glenn raised his hand, which I think is good because that happens frequently in our house as I wrestle with some particular piece of scripture, and he tells me what he thinks it means, and I say you're all wrong, and I do something different with it. Uh, but outside of those who are regularly preaching, um, we've had a few who are, have recently done what Cleopas and his friend were doing, maybe during Bible study. But, but how many just in conversation, in the same kind of conversation that we had about, did you see the snow last night? 
Um, did you, have you been thinking about Jesus lately? Like, it's been on my mind. I don't think many of us do that. And I wonder, is that because, like, the snow this morning is new news, right? This is new news. It's April, there's snow. It's worth remarking upon. But are we not talking about Jesus because, like we heard in this morning's hymn, it's the old, old story? Is the story about Jesus old news? In, in that context, that that's old news for us, but new news for Cleopas and his friend, how could they have helped but to be talking about Jesus and the events in Jerusalem? Because we do that all the time. Did you hear on the news? Or did you see so-and-so painted their front door? Whatever is newsworthy, noteworthy in our country, our world, in our community, in our family, uh, we talk about that. But do we do that with our gospel story? So I've been thinking about this. Just how do we tell the story of Jesus? Or do we even bother to tell it at all? Or is it okay to just come here and listen to some bits and pieces of it each week? Are we telling the story that we proclaim is dearest in our hearts to those around us? Now, I don't necessarily mean turning to the person next to you in line at the grocery store and asking if they know Jesus. And sometimes I think our conversation about Jesus and how we show the good news in the world comes more through our actions. Um, so it might mean helping that person next to us in line lift something heavy or pick up something that they've dropped. And it's about living every moment of our lives as Christ has taught us, living with a loving, open heart to those around us. But there are times that it might mean telling the story of Jesus. So I have a friend from high school who is now an esthetician. And uh, she has a small tattoo of the Jesus fish on one of her hands. I know she's a Christian. But uh, one time when she was doing my nails, I asked her why she had that tattoo. Since it's so obvious. And how many of us are so obvious about our faith. And she told me that it serves two purposes. One is to remind her that as she does her work, she is to do it in a loving and Christ-like manner because she can't escape seeing that as she works with her hands. And I would suppose that rings especially true when she washes people's feet. But she says the second purpose is to be a conversation starter. So if someone asks her about it, she tells them of its first purpose. But if they ask more questions, she uses it as an opportunity to share the Jesus story with those she serves. I don't wear my Christianity as obviously as she does outside of here in the secular world, but I do look for opportunities and openings to share the Jesus story and what it means to me. Many people are curious, you know, many people who don't come to church every week, uh, many people who haven't been to church in their life, they're still very curious. Um, and if we are open to those opportunities and those questions and we, we treat them with reverence and, and grace and loving kindness and respect as we answer their questions, those are opportunities. I, I overheard a conversation in my workplace lunchroom a while ago and, and the question was, does every denomination have its own Bible? The, co the conversation was among people who were not church people, like do the Catholics use this Bible and does someone else use that Bible? And I, I took it as an opportunity to explain, yes, there's many translations, but the Bible's the Bible. So while an individual church may choose, like you folks do, to use the NRSV, others might use the good news, but the stories are the same. And then one person asked, so if someone was interested in reading the Bible, what one do you think they should start with? And I said, if I was reading it and I hadn't read it before, I'd read the message. It's not in columns, it's got user-friendly language, it's easy to understand. And I was so impressed to see at this person's desk, uh, a few weeks later, a message Bible with a bookmark in it. 
And she said to me, thank you. Thank you for not saying something that made me think I was stupid for not understanding. And thank you for giving me something that was easy for me to access and read. So there are moments in our days that may not seem obvious. We need to treat them, treat them with reverence and respect. Because I don't think we need to be Bible thumpers. I don't think we need to beat people over the head with Christianity. But I think that we can quietly move through our lives with an awareness of our Christianity and, a, and an awareness that when the time is right, we can share that story with others. So here, that's talking about sharing the story with people who may not know the story or may not be as familiar with it as us. But I, I also wonder, here's a question, are we talking even about that story amongst ourselves? Are we having frank and open discussions about our faith and our doubt and our feelings about it with the people that we come together with every week to hear about it? Are we sharing the story with our family, our spouses, and our friends that we know to be Christian? It is one thing to be shy about one's faith with people who may or may not share it, but are we being shy about discussing it with those whom we know to be Christians? I'm a firm believer that scripture is for all people in all times, so what does this week's scripture have to say for us these people in this time. Like Cleopas and his companion, we are on a journey. We have heard the Jesus story and we are walking with the knowledge of the events of Holy Week in our hearts. But we don't travel alone. We have companions on this road and while we're traveling, we can talk about the story, not just the Easter story, but all the lessons of Jesus' life in this world, the parables, the teachings, the things that he did. And as we're traveling, here's the most important part, as we're traveling, Jesus will meet us where we are. Perhaps when we least expect it. And we may not recognize him at first, but at some point on the trip, we will know for certain that he travels with us. And so as Christians, we can have confidence in our main character. And as an Easter people, we can be prepared for surprise endings. Amen.